you, Jesus. Amen. Come Hallelujah. On. Give him another hand clap of praise this morning, would you? I am thankful. We should be thankful. I was the one. I was the one that he left the 99 for. If you can't remember being the one, just take a second. Remember being the one when he was dealing with your heart and loving the ugly out of you, right? I love when he loves some junk out of me, don't you? I'm glad he's not a God that just slaps you upside the head, straighten up, son, or I'm going to send you down to the pit. He is a loving God. He is a God that left the 99 to come after you. I loved being the one. No offense to you guys. I love being the one. And I remember him coming after me, loving on me, offering me grace, extending me grace and peace and calm. And that grace defeated shame and it defeated guilt and it re defeated regret. And I can stand today confident in the Lord I serve, confident in the Lord you serve, that he's a loving God. He is a loving God this morning. I, that song is one of my favorite songs because it's just plain, right? It's just plain that no matter where you're at right this moment in your life, if you're lost and undone, if you're not in right relationship with Christ, or maybe you're all hells broke loose and you feel like there's an overturn, that this God they're singing about, willing to leave the 99 to come for you, you, if it was only you, willing to leave lighting up the shadows and the darkness in our life. I love when he kicks down the door. You see, that's beautiful to me, that he would be willing. He makes such an entrance into your life that the devil knows to get out. He makes such an entrance into your life. There's no wall he won't kick down. No wall. Shame and defeat and regret have to go. Amen. Amen. Are you good? Y'all good? I want to share a couple of things. You can be seated if you'd like. I want to share a couple of things. Pastor Tammy and I have been out of town again uh, this week, and I say again uh, because you know we go four or five times a year. Uh, this was no different. I, you just probably need to know why we're going out of town. Uh, we told first service, and I don't usually tell opposites, but we got cameras off, so we will. Uh, your church or your pastor uh, has been asked to be a, a church coach for the IPHC. There's 26 coaches right now, and, they're, and, and that is awesome. But I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why I get that privilege, why we get that humble experience, uh, is because th th there's 26 coaches, and there's 1,750 churches. You're welcome to figure that up if you want. I haven't because I don't want to know, right? <laughs> I get to do that because of you, because of our parking lot folks, because of our door folks, because of what you've done. When, you, they come, when people come in this building, you begin to love people from the, from the parking lot. And, and so that reflects well on everybody here. That reflects well on life changers, reflects well apparently on your pastors. And we get that privilege and that honor to be church coaches for the IPHC and a part of the Evangelism USA and the IPHC. And so while we're out and about, we're honestly, this past week we started at 8.30 in the morning. Somebody said, I hope you enjoy your vacation. We start at 8.30 every morning, we end at 4.30, and we have to be back at 5. Thank God that there's motels within three minutes of the, of, of the church or our training place. And so we run out, uh, change shirts, and brush our teeth. I think that's fair, right? Probably fair to everyone else as well. And so then we're there from 5 till about 9. And so, I, 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 listen, you guys send us there, whether you know it or not. And we know it's going to benefit this ministry. But our, you already know our mission is one more. One more family, uh, one more person added to the kingdom of heaven, absolutely. One more family added to the church. And uh, our mission is not subject to this room. And so because our mission is not subject to this room, it's been identified in Oklahoma City that they want us, you, to be the model church. A model church for IPHC that we bring other churches in and say, this is how you love on people. Parking lot guys, this is how you work the parking lot door guys. This is how you work the doors People, this is how you love people and so it's not because of what we've done Okay, don't ever think it's we've far from arrived It's not what we do. We get this privilege and this honor because of what you do And so if you'll just take a second would you take a second and give yourself a hand this morning? We are very excited for the mission for the mission, but our one more our one more motto or our one more stand is also for that church down there and that church over there and that church out there. 
You see, we're growing the kingdom of God. We are kingdom, kingdom kingdom-minded, and we want the kingdom to grow. We're not in competition with anyone. We want people, we want churches to grow. Can I tell you that only 19% of people in the United States attend church? 19%. Only 16% claim to be Christians. Surely, out of the 30,000 people in Wythe County, can I help you with something? We're far from 19%. But all the churches, we could fill them all up and we're still going to be in deficit. We need to reach people outside this building. We need to have an understanding that your pastors, it's not about our travels. I'll be honest with you. Is it a vacation? We love to learn. We're a little bit weird. I'm a little weird. What I know is that I don't know everything. And what I get when I get there is I still don't know everything, but I know more than I did on Monday. And so we're thankful for the opportunity. And we'll be heading out again. No no times. Okay, I can't remember. (laughs) Pastor Tammy will tell me when we're heading out of town again. And I'll let you know. But we're just excited. And I want you to be excited that God is using this church to change IPHC churches uh, across the nation. And we are so excited about that. We know God's going to use this church to grow churches, to plant churches, and to do multi-site services. And so are you with, I hope you're with me on that. Amen. So we thank you this morning. And we're very excited. We're very excited. Amen. Amen. Are you ready for the word? Okay. Now we're on TV. Praise the Lord. And, and so maybe, maybe we came this morning with a mindset that, you know what, I'm going to go see what that's all about. I want to see what's happening. I, I don't know why you came this morning, uh, what your mission was. Maybe you came because your wife said you're coming. Wife, thank you. Right? And if you have to get a little more stern, we give you permission. And, and so maybe you're here because your husband's made up his mind. Maybe you're here because the kids said... I want to be in the, whatever reason you're here today, I do know one thing, you're here to receive a word from God. I'm not talking uh, about, I'm not a big sermonette guy. I just don't do, I don't want you to just feel good for the moment. I, I don't want you to get a feel good message and then go all to pieces tomorrow. I don't want you to feel good and then by Wednesday, your life is upside down. Our, our mission is to give you a word that changes your life, amen, that gives you direction. It gives you focus on what God is calling you to do. When we stepped out of 19, it was a perfect opportunity for every church in the world, and we're doing it, and they're doing it, to focus on this 2020 uh, year, this 2020 vision. Uh, Maybe we've been operating at a 2200. Maybe we didn't have everything clear. Maybe everything, you weren't focused. Maybe you didn't know why Pastor Tammy and I do some traveling, but now that you know, right, so we all have the same focus this morning, that our mission is for the lost, our mission is for souls, our mission is to get families connected into this family, that they can grow and they can move and they can be everything God's called them to be. And so when we grab this, when you, if you don't have the same information, you can't have the same vision. If you don't have the same information, you can't have the same vision. And so our vision this year is, is that we get on track, right? We, we line up with according to the, not that our vision wasn't then, but whatever we got wrong in 19, we're going to do better in 20. Whatever we got wrong yesterday, we're going to do better today. And so I believe that through the word today, uh, that no matter where you're at, can I just pick on somebody for a second? Now, maybe you won't think this is uh, pretty, but I'm not about pretty a lot of times, right? That's why some of you here that we're not about pretty, uh, but we are about the truth. And so can I challenge you with the truth this morning? Those of us, those of you, those folks that have kind of, it's been instilled in your mind to use this statement as an excuse or a reason or a substitute or whatever makes you feel better. Those folks that say I'm waiting on God and they've said it for 10 years and 9 years, and they've said it for 5 years, and they've said it for uh, 16 years, and they've been saying it since you've known them, waiting on God. Can I, can I help you with something? You are not waiting on God. I'm going to be real. From Genesis in the beginning to Revelation, amen, God has equipped you with everything you need to be what he's called you to be, to have what he's called you to have, to do what he's called you to do. He has equipped you with everything you need. You're not waiting on him. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on us to get a revelation from this word this morning, to get a revelation from a simple statement. The ball is in your court. The ball's in your court. 
You're not waiting on him to serve. He served. The ball's in your court. He's waiting on you to pick it up. Do whatever you do with it. Hit it, hit it. Run with it, run with it. Shoot it, shoot it. Whatever that thing is that he's called you, do it. He has put the ball in your court. And from the foundation of the earth, he put the ball in your court. You can probably remember in Genesis uh, chapter 2 when Adam and Eve were hanging out, right? You remember while they were hanging out, God had a word for them and a simple word for them or maybe a simple restriction that he had put on them. And so let me grab this first. If you made bad decisions in 19, can I tell you how to make good decisions in 20? You make good decisions by learning from your bad decisions. Pastor, how do you guys make good decisions? By learning from the bad decisions, by learning from my mistakes and my errors, by learning from those things that I didn't get right, but I wasn't waiting on God. He was waiting on me. For you not to make a decision is a bad decision. It just is. For you not to make a decision is a bad decision. And if you don't believe me, look at the highways. They are scattered with flat squirrels. (laughs) Truth or not. I've about wrecked cars over it, right? That squirrel going left. Okay, we're good. Going right. He changed his mind. For him not to make a decision cost him his life. So I'm wondering if maybe, you see, I'm that guy that when we leave the house, I'll start to tell Pastor Tammy something a couple miles down the road. Squirrel. We'll get where we're going, and she'll say, okay, start from where you did at the house and tell me what you were going to tell me. I've already forgot. So squirrel, I can relate to squirrel. I get that. I'm, I'm hard to stay focused. I just am. My mind's running. I don't even know, right? If it was a, if it was a hamster on the wheel, the wheel would have done wore out. So I have to be focused this morning so that you get an understanding that you make good decisions. What? By learning from your bad decisions. If the bad decisions stifle you, stall you, hold you hostage, you will never make good decisions. You will never make a decision. I truly would rather our leadership, instead of calling me and saying, what should I do? Call me and say, this is what I've done. And you know what? Didn't work out too good. Just wanted you to know there might be some overflow in this. Uh, might be something happened in this. I made a bad, you know what I'm going to say? Well, thank you for making a decision. But if you send me a message that is, requires my input and I send you back a message that says, what do you think? It's, a, I want you to make a decision. I want you to get in the, or get in the word or get in the mind of Christ, let Christ get in the mind of you and we make up our mind. And so the ball's in your court from the foundation of the earth. God has given us free will. Genesis chapter 2 and 16, you probably remember, Adam is walking in the garden, right? And in the cool of the day, he spent time with God. Man, how awesome is that? That he literally spent time with God. But God saw that he needed a helpmate. It was never meant for man to be alone. And so he made him a helpmate, right? Put him to sleep, took a rib, made Eve. Must have been an awesome day. Wouldn't you think it had been an awesome day? I think it had been an awesome day. I'm just saying. And so you went from dirt to life. And then he takes a part of you and makes someone else. I'm wondering if you've ever tried that. I'm wondering if you've ever took a part of you and instilled it in someone else to reproduce the thing that God is doing in you. I'll have to preach that later, but have you thought about that? That you can allow God to take that part of, oh, I can't do that because I'll be preaching all day long. Let's look at 16. Verse number 16, it said, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree in the garden you may eat freely. Did I tell you? Free will. God gave us free will from the foundation of the earth. And so we look at it in verse number 17. But the tree, you can eat anything else. But the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. Can they eat it? No. They cannot eat it. But will they? For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So from the foundation of the earth, we've had free will. And what's crazy about free will, you see, I'm wondering, I'm thankful for free will. I have learned a lot of lessons with free will. Pastor Tammy will tell you, I've learned a lot of stuff of what to do as a leader in the kingdom of heaven, as a husband, as a father, as a friend, as a neighbor. I've learned a lot of what to do's. But listen, I have learned more about what not to do. 
My, my bad decisions have helped me in my future decisions. My bad decisions have not crippled me, stifled me, stalled me, hijacked me, held me hostage because I know that if I make that decision again, then I'm right back in the same mess I was in before. And so I don't understand it, but I guess that's where we're at. And so free will brought sin into the world. That would be enough for me if I was God to say, okay, but free will's over, boys. It's done. These, these two hijackers right here, I'm going to let them walk it out in sin, but the rest of them, I'm, I'm going to make them serve me. But see, aren't you thankful that he's not a dictator? Aren't you thankful that he offered a way out? And so as, as, as uh, free will brought sin into the world, Jesus, in his free will, brought forgiveness into the world. And so now where's the ball? When Adam and Eve sinned and there was no remission for sin, we could bring sacrifice and we do it year after year. We do it season after season, feast after feast. But where's the promise in that? So I get to live miserable for the next three months till feast time. I get to live miserable till the next sacrifice. I get to live miserable. But Jesus went to Calvary and was raised on the third day so that you and I with a torn veil can go into the Holy of Holies 24-7, 365, seven days a week. And we find ourselves with the ball being in our court. Permission, power, and here's the thing, authority. Authority, I have the authority to pick that ball up. I have the permission from the king of glory to pick that. But the ball is in my court. And so when people say I'm waiting on God, when people say I'm waiting on this or I'm waiting on that or I'm waiting. Listen, listen. Make a decision. Make a decision. He put the ball in your court at Calvary. He put the ball in your court at the empty tomb. He put the ball in your court this morning. That you say 19 may have been slam ugly. 19, may have, I may have stunk up 19, but in 2020, the ball is in my court, and I'm running with it. I'm shooting it. I'm taking opportunity. I'm going to do everything God's called me to do because the ball is in my court. But instead, we find ourselves using that. Maybe uh, sometimes we use that liberty, right? We take that liberty to do our own thing. Oh, I have freedom in Jesus. I can do my own thing. No, you can't. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof is death. That's, we're good, right? No tautology in that, right? It's just straight Jesus. It's straight word. And so we find that in scripture. And a lot of times we use it as an excuse to not do something instead of a reason to do something. I'm thankful that we live in the greatest country in the world because as good as we have it, I'd hate to be anywhere else. As good as we have it, we still don't serve him like we need to serve him, follow him like we need to follow him, lock in like we need to lock in, do like we need to do, be what we need to be. As, as easy as we have it in this nation, can you imagine if we were hiding out in a basement with, a guard, with someone watching and keeping watch and tearing pages out of the Bible so that you and I could grab some knowledge of the word of God? Can you imagine if we can't live it when we have everything we need, we can march into Walmart and buy anything we want. If you can think of it, you can get it on the internet and we still can't serve him. Wow. I've got it made and can't serve him. What if I was in bondage? What, I, what if I was held under the thumb of some military? What if I was held under the thumb of some regime? What if I was uh, in a place where they didn't allow it and they would behead me? I hear people say, I'd love to have been with Paul. You cracking me up. Been with Paul. <laughs> been with Paul. You'd have been with Paul when he was shipwrecked five times, when he was beaten, when he was thrown in prison, beat within an inch of his death, within an inch of his life. You want to be with Paul? You ain't been beat since your mama run you out of house. You won't go with Paul. Y'all killing me. You people break me down. Y'all killing me. I don't be with Paul. I'll just be real with you. I love reading about Paul. <laughs> if we called people in the Bible characters, he's my favorite character in the Bible. Why? Because he's who I want to be. That when all hell breaks loose, I'm still in. When it don't go my way, I'm still in. When it seems like I've been forsaken, I'm still in. When everybody's turned their backs on me, I'm still in. When, when they've abandoned me and forsaken me, I'm still in. I want to be that Paul that at the end of my days, I say I fought a good fight. I finished the race. And, and, and here I stand getting ready to depart from this earth to that place. How exciting. 
you want to be with Paul. <laughs> that breaks me down. So we find ourselves even in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13. Is, uh, uh, did I say every excuse to not, but no reason to? Because that's where we stand, right? That's where we're on the, we're on the center line of the road and every excuse not to do it, but no reason to do it. I have a reason to do it. There was a Jesus that loved me enough to die for me. That's reason enough. There was a Jesus that was willing to go to the whipping post for my healing. That's reason enough. There was a Jesus that walked over 600 yards with my cross on his back, died with my sin on his shoulders, went to the to a uh, borrowed tomb, and was raised on the third day, and in between went to hell and took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. That's reason to serve him. You've not done that for me. I've not done that for you. I don't look for every excuse not to. I want to find every reason to. That he said that I would find peace in him. I would find calm in him. I would find direction in him. And here's the tough one, correction in him. I love that when he says, I want to correct you a little bit. Okay, he's never said that. He corrects me a lot. I've never had him correct me a little bit. Why? Why? Because I get a, more than a little bit out of line, right? My attitude's not always pretty. I've not run out and done crazy stuff. Don't misunderstand me, but I still need to be in check every day. I catch myself every day making sure I'm in right relationship, making sure I'm in communion with God, making sure. I like to make sure. Why would you do that? The same reason I do with my wife. I want my relationship to be sure and strong and true that I have an understanding if nobody else has an understanding. The ball is in my court. Can I pick on marriages for a second? You know I'm going to anyway, so an amen would be awesome. <laughs> and so marriages, I, I heard somebody say, there's just no fire in our marriage. I'm a listener. Okay, so when you're talking and I'm within 20 feet, be careful. You may not know I heard it, but I will preach about it. <laughs> My husband don't look at me the way he used to look at me. My wife don't look at me like she used to look at me. I don't feel like there's any fire. I, I think his fire has gone out. I think her fire has gone out. Can I help you, husbands and wives, if you've ever said that? And here's the thing. What you'll get from this right now is that I'll never say it again. If Pastor Todd's within 20 feet. <laughs> so his fire's gone out. And so I'm wondering, what happened to the fire? What happened to it? What happened to it? What happened to the fire? Hey, wife. Kindle the fire. Yeah. Not everybody's supposed to wear a size 5X sweatsuit pants. Just saying. Kindle the fire. That sweatshirt from back whenever. It... Ain't no fire in that. You know who can build a fire in me? Pastor Tammy. <laughs> you know what we've learned in 30 years of marriage? If I feel like her fire's burning out, I'm going to light a fire. I don't even know what that looks like for you. I know what it looks like for me. Just. <laughs> I want her like that. How about I keep her like that? I was running five miles a day when we started dating. Five miles a day. 
And if you see me running, run with me because something's after me. <laughs> Carter said, I like it. <laughs> fire. And so the same opportunity that I have daily to build a fire in our marriage is the same opportunity I have to keep my fire burning in my walk with God. He's already done. He's already, he has all, he's already done his part. So the ball is in my court. So I get in the word and I say, show me, lead me, give me something that I know that I know I'm having a bad day and I'm not waiting on God. He's waiting on me. The same way you keep the fire going in your marriage. And if you don't, you better after today because she's here listening. <laughs> He's listening. I'm going to guess that we're going to have an influx, an overflow of sweatsuits at Goodwill this week. <laughs> okay, I'm hoping. I'm just, because if you're happy at home, you'll be happy at church. I better get before I get in trouble. And so, <laughs> here's, here's the thing. Oh, y'all can't handle the thing. Let's get. And so we find ourselves uh, in the Word of God. I hope you find yourselves in the Word of God. And when you find yourselves in the Word of God, you find that the Scripture says, do not find every excuse not to, but find every reason to. But it says that do not use your freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to and just destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Galatians 5 and 13. I, it is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. He called, and so if I'm bound, who's it on? Me. If I'm un, who's it on? Me. The ball is in your court. You have been given permission that, that it, rather than being uh, using as an excuse to slack, an excuse to rebel, an excuse to blame, an excuse to sin, I'm going to take this freedom and liberty and the grace of God and use it as a reason to do good for him. To love him, to honor him, to love my wife, honor my wife, to keep that spark burning in my walk with God, to keep that spark burning at my house, to keep that spark burning in my relationships with brothers and sisters of the Lord. And I use the word of God as a reason to do it. Mark chapter 8, and you're wondering if I'm going to finish in four minutes, turn to your neighbor and say, no. <laughs> Will he be finished by 12? Hallelujah. Just slap somebody upside the hand. I almost said head. And say no. Mark chapter 8 verse 34. It says. When he had called the people to himself. His disciples also. He said unto them. Whoever desires to come after me. Let him deny himself. Take up his cross. And follow me. So from the foundation of the earth. With Adam and Eve. He put the ball in our court. All the, all the way here in Mark. He put the ball in our court. He's saying, hey, I'm giving you permission to follow me. But if you're going to follow me in spirit and truth, take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Deny your flesh. Deny your status that you're shooting for. Deny your pride that you're riding on. Deny your preconceived ideas of what I might do with you or what you think you deserve to be done with. And ride with me. Go with me. Follow me. The reason a lot of people don't follow God is because that they can't have it their way. That's the only reason Burger King has stayed around as long as they have. That's the one place you can go and have it your way, right? I don't, I don't go there. Why? Because I feel guilty having it my way. Okay, I'm kidding. I do go there. $1.49 for 10 nuggets. Who's not going to go there? And so we go there with an understanding that we'll likely get what we ordered and we're not going to be waiting very long and we're going to get it. And so we've become a microwave world with a marinating God and that's why we quit and that's why we pout and that's why we wander off and don't do the will of God and don't stay in the will of God because we've become a microwave world with a marinating God. Wait on him, right? Pastor, you said I wasn't waiting. You said I'm not waiting on God. Let me share something right here. 
When you begin to follow him, he's put it in your court. When he called you to follow him, and you can deny yourself in your court. Take up your cross in your court. Follow me in your court. Right? Am I waiting on him to do anything? I'm not. Open a door of opportunity? Absolutely. Possibility. Open up a door to ministry? Yes. But while I'm waiting, what am I doing? I'm not just waiting. I'm preparing myself. We've got people in this church that said, I want to do something for God. We ask them to do something for God. And, and they'll disappear for six months. That's a true story. They'll disappear for six months. Because they're afraid you're going to ask them to do something for God after they've said, I want to do something for God. <laughs> I want to do more for God. Yeah. Well, we'll see. So we follow the will of God in our call of what? Obedience. We follow the will of God in our call to what? Sacrifice. So following the will of God requires us to have humility. Following the will of God requires some confidence. You're never going to get where God wants you to go unless you get some confidence. Quit apologizing to every naysayer that comes along. There was a statement, and I can't remember who said it. If I remember, I'll post it on Facebook. But it said that uh, if I stop and throw rocks at every dog that barks at me, I'll never reach my destiny. If I, if I stop and throw rocks at every dog barking at me, I will never reach my destiny. If you stop and listen to every naysayer, every person that has nothing good to say about you or what God's called you to do, you will never reach your destiny. There comes a time when you're confident in who you are and whose you are and the call of God that's on your life. And you get your head up and you put your shoulders back and you say, God called me to it. He's going to see me through it. He didn't call me to drag anybody with me. He called me to do it. And so the ball's in our court again, and I promise I'm closing. When we begin to follow him, when it says that we need to deny ourselves, that means we deny our pride and our plans and our preconceived ideas. How many of you are more worthy of something than anyone else in here? Don't, thanks for no one raising their hand. But the, in your spirit right now, you can say, you know what? That's been me. I felt like I deserved something just because it was me. I felt like I earned something just because it was me. I felt like I should have, and I, I would have, and I thought sure that it would. Well, here's what you can think. Think about why I didn't you. Is that okay? Have you denied yourself? Have you swallowed your pride? Have you made it a priority to follow him instead of him following you? Have you decided that I, 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 I'm going to live a life according to the word of God and not try to make the word of God line up with my life? Do I come to church to have a life-changing experience or do I come to church to get enough to ease my conscience? You see, people will know the difference. They'll see the difference. They'll smell the difference. True story. Romans chapter 13 and 2 says this, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordin ordinance of God. So if I go against authority, I'm going against the standards of God. I'll never talk politics per uh, political party, but I will talk a little politics. When you go against authority, you've just gone against God. I don't care who you are or who they are. Right? I appreciate nobody walking out. Because that's just what it is. When you rebel against authority, when you resist authority, you have resisted the ordinance of God. When you rebel against your boss at work, you're against the authority of God. You're against the ordinance and the standards of God. When you rebel and, and talk about your president, your governor, uh, your whoever, and you're always spouting some kind of foolishness, you're walking and operating contrary to the word and the standards of God. Dude, that'll slow down on my post on Facebook. <laughs> Did I tell you I love you? Did I tell you the ball's in your court? Because whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on who? Themselves. So whose ball is that in? Whose court is that ball in? Right, mine. So if I'm going to bring judgment on myself, you can't, your decisions don't bring judgment on me. My decisions don't bring judgments on, judgment on you. 
the only one that can bring judgment on you is yeah. And so today it's pretty simple. The ball's in your court. I stand before you today with an understanding and with the authority of the word of God that the ball is in my court. I know what he's called us to do. He's called us to go outside of here, forget about these four walls and go outside of here and love my neighbor as myself. He's called me to love the Lord our God with all our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength, with everything that's in us. And those two, first two commandments, two of the greatest commandments. And so we begin to do that and what happens? But here's the thing, you're called to do it, but will you do it? You know, my goal, and I couldn't find one, was to have a tennis ball launcher up here and let Pastor Tammy run it. Just drop one in it every couple of seconds if I don't get an amen, Pastor Tammy. When there's no amen, you launch one. And whoever gets hit by that ball will remember this message. Hey, what happened to your eye? Ball's in my court. <laughs> yeah I'm either going to leave it laying there as a word from God or I'm going to pick it up and let it be a word from God and so it's up to you and me that from this day forward you are held responsible to the fact that the ball is in your court I'm going to be the greatest follower I've ever been I'm going to be the greatest leader I've ever been I'm going to be the greatest husband I've ever been. It's in your court. I'm going to be the greatest wife that's ever been, the greatest mom or the greatest dad. See, here's the thing. From this day forward, you have knowledge of the Word, so you're no longer ignorant. Ignorant is it. Listen, when somebody calls you ignorant, it's okay because it means lack of knowledge. It means you've not been taught that yet. And so today, no one is going to leave ignorant. You might leave and go stupid, but you can't go ignorant. <laughs> Did I say I love you? And so with the knowledge and armed with the knowledge of the Word of God, then 2020 has to be different for you and your husband, you and your wife, you and your family, you and this church. That in, that in 2019, I stunk it up, but 2020, and, and honey, I apologize, and it's okay. See, here's the thing, fellas, I know you hate to apologize, don't you? Men don't apologize, just send flowers. So right now, with your spouse's hand in your hand, I'm sorry, honey. 2020 is going to be our year. I apologize there's not been a fire, but I'm going to do something about that. I apologize if I've shirked my responsibility, but I'm going to do something about that. Because I realize today the ball's in my court. Honey, I apologize for blaming you for everything. Because today I see that the ball's in my court. I'm sorry that they're having to do it all at that church. I'm sorry that we need 100 leaders and only have 65. I'm going to pick my ball up and do what God's called me to do. I'm going to take, the, I'm going to take control. I'm, I'm not waiting anymore. I'm going to take control. The ball's in my court. And so we stand today with the ball in our court, and it's beautiful to have that knowledge. But will you pick it up? Will you grab it? Will you do it? Will you follow it? Because when he says to love your neighbor as yourself, can I help you with something? That means drug addict neighbor, homosexual neighbor, alcoholic neighbor, Muslim neighbor. I know I'm getting on somebody's skin here. I get it. I get it. He didn't say pick a flesh tone and love them. Love your neighbor as yourself. Can I tell you when you can do that? This is why that's the second commandment. You know when you can do that? When you honor the first one, when you begin to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and you focus on God, when you take focus off everything else and you focus on God, that's when you can love people that's unlovable, reach people that's unreachable, begin to teach people that's unteachable. That's when you and I can grab that mindset of one more, no matter what they look like, what they smell like. The conference we went to this past week, I don't know, there was only a handful of us guys there that wasn't tattooed up, right? Guess what happened when they got saved? Same thing happened to you. They got saved. <laughs> Just saying. 
What about those people? You think they'll go to heaven? Absolutely. You think their tattoos will? Uh, no. No. Your fake eyelashes won't, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Those pearly whites you put in that cup every night won't, right? Listen, God has a plan in 2020. And the only way we can grab that plan and walk it out, love it out, work it out, is to have a revelation that the ball's in my court. Let's pray this morning. God, we're truly thankful this morning. We give you glory. God, we love you today. And Lord, I'm thankful for the word of God. I'm thankful, Lord, that you give us knowledge that we will not leave here ignorant. But God, with the knowledge, armed with the knowledge of the word, we will stand against the enemy. We will stand against the critics. We will stand against the naysayers and say, I'm running with this. I'm hitting this. I'm shooting. Whatever, whatever ball is in your court, whatever he has rolled into your court, thrown into your court, tossed into your court, I declare today over this congregation, we not only have a ball in our court, but we're going to pick it up and we're going to run with it. And so God, right now, it's off topic, but I just pray, Lord, that as we begin to walk in the will and the purpose of God for our lives, our marriages become stronger. We become the dads that we should have been all along and the husbands that we should have been all along and the wives that we should have been all along and the moms that we should have been all along, the leaders that we should have been all along. So God, we praise you today. For every person in this building and every family that's represented, I know there's purpose in this place. There is calling in this place. There is destiny in this place. God, let us pick up the ball. Let us pick up the ball for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Maybe this morning, if you were bold enough, you'd say, Pastor, I needed that word. I've used the excuse, every excuse not to do it, instead of every reason to do it. And it's going to take a little honesty if you're bold enough to slip up your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's me. That's me. That's me. My 2020 is going to be better than my 2019. My tomorrow is going to be better than my yesterday. I'm grabbing that ball, and I'm going to run with it. I'm going to run with Honey, I'm going to be that husband. I'm going to be that wife. I'm going to be that dad. Son, daughter, I'm going to be that parent. We're going to change our destiny for the glory of God. He is waiting on me to step up and be what he's called me. He is waiting on me to do what he's called me to do. He is waiting on me. And this morning, I surrender. I take up my cross. I put away my preconceived ideas. I put away my plan. I put away my pride. I put away what I thought should have been and what should be. And God, the ball's in my court. Maybe today your hand's down. Maybe today you would just be bold enough to say, Pastor, I'm not in right relationship with God, but I want to be. And thank you. And you'd slip your hand up. Amen. You're not alone. You're not alone. Would you whisper that thank you? Thank you. Would you whisper this prayer with me? Is that you? The Bible says if you'll confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. That's it. No, no cartwheels, no catechisms, I'm not being mean, I'm just saying. That's the requirement that you acknowledge Him as King of glory. You say, I'm a sinner, I need a Savior, and you're the Savior. Declare that this morning. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. I believe that you rose on the third day, and I declare from this day forward, I'll never be the same for the glory of God, in Jesus' name. Somebody say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you give God a hand clap of praise this morning? He's worthy, amen? He is worthy. Listen, we love you. What we want is that you get more than you need. That when you leave here, you feel like you can conquer the world. How can I? Because he said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
So when you hit the world out there, you hit the world with your hands raised, your shoulders back, and your head up, and declare, I'm a child of a king. I'm a child of a king. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to take your guest cards.